are you ready to start? Yes, yes, I am. Yes. I don't have a presentation. I will just, uh, yeah, speak uh, like this. Great, great. Mm -hmm. So we are continuing with our next keynote with the top provoking uh, title, Secret Souls for Accelerating Innovation. And our next speaker will be John Drakenberg, who is a co-founder and CEO of Alex Therapeutics. Alex Therapeutics combines psychology, technology, and design to empower people to live longer, healthier, and happier lives. The company launches C-certified cognitive behavioral therapy apps and use their own AI engine to replicate a psycholo psychologist intuition. The mission is to supply the world with non-human standalone personalized treatments through one's phone in the area of addiction, mental illness, and chronic diseases. John, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for that, that kind introduction. So, uh, yeah. So, hi, everyone. Uh, super happy to be here. Um, it's been a really uh, interesting day and uh, with a lot of good speakers, I think, a lot of good insights. Um, when I, I was chosen for this topic, um, uh, it, it, of course, left me with a lot of, of room to decide what I wanted to speak about. Uh, but today I'm going to um, sort of give you some more context and background of uh, just quickly my background and also going into Alex Therapeutics, what we're all about uh, briefly. Um, and then I will tell you the big secret um, about the, the secret sauce and go through a couple of insights that I have uh, learned along the way uh, over the years uh, working in digital therapeutics and building this company. So, you know, the, the theme for today is digital health and digital therapeutics. Um, and me personally, my background, I, um, you know, have been doing entrepreneurship since a very young age. Uh, started my first company at the age of 15 in tutoring and private education for uh, children with dyslexia. And um, it was amazing to see that the sort of helping them both with school and homework, but also with the psychological aspects of suffering from dyslexia, being able to coach them um, on their journey of you know getting good, better grades and also building a greater self-confidence. Um, I have a dual degree in psychology and in business and economics. And um, I've been a tech nerd for my entire life. I'm a lousy programmer, but I, I'm... Uh, been following the tech industry and building computers since a very young age. And um, if you combine psychology, technology, and uh, you know business, then that's re you're really hitting my, my sweet spot. I've also started and worked abroad in Hong Kong and New York, but found my way back uh, to Stockholm, where I am today, and where we are based as a company. And um, um, spent a couple of years here in the tech startup industry, working for other tech startups. Um, and before founding Alex, I was also in executive search. So I um, hired, uh, hired, you know, super senior executive managers for big companies. It was very exciting to get into the boardrooms and the management rooms of uh, big giants like Microsoft or uh, Google and be able to sort of find out where their industry is heading and how we can find their next, um, you know, C-suit person for, for the company. Um, but I also, after a while, felt this was an itch. I wanted to get back to entrepreneurship. Um, um, I was not a big fan of the sort of big American corporate culture um, at this big uh, executive search firm. Um, so I, um, I decided to quit and then to found Alex. Uh, and Alex is founded with my co-founder, Oliver Fleetwood. Uh, he has a PhD in something called Theoretical Computational Biophysics. So he's definitely the smarter co-founder um, in the team. And he's also um, our technical co-founder and our CTO today. So he has a tons of experience of, you know, yeah, both being a CTO, but also how you work with data and use data analysis to, uh, um, yeah, to drive insights, to predict the future, to personalize and customize. Um, and together we started this company back in 2018. Um, and we set out on a journey to sort of see how can we build products, digital, fully digital products that can profoundly change people's lives. That was sort of the goal. And we wanted to focus on many different indications, but generally in the areas of addiction, of mental health, and also some somatic diseases like uh, diabetes, for instance, and some chronic, chronic issues. Um, and 
the same day that we uh, founded the company, we also got our first investors on board, which uh, was the ca uh, the Candy Crush creators, so the King founders. Um, and ironically, you know, Candy Crush, as many of you know, uh, is one of the most addictive mobile games probably out there. Um, they knew a lot about addiction uh, and a lot about how you set up a process of building products that really are enjoyable by the by the end users. Um, and I will come back to this a little bit uh, later, but because I think this is a really one of the important points I want to make for for today. Um, but just taking a step back and and looking at the topic for today, the secret sauce for accelerating innovation. And I mean, for me, the secret is that there are no one secret sauce. Um, there are so many different elements that has to be, you know, where you have to excel um, and where you really want to. Um, yeah, we really need to, um, to to do a great job. And I think for us as a company, we are a, a legal manufacturer. So that means that what we do is that we have a team of psychologists, uh, of you know developers, front end developers, back end developers, designers, um, who are um, and you know also business people who are working together uh, day in and day out to develop and create this digital therapeutics products. And Alex, as a company, we focus on the more sort of hardcore digital therapeutics. That means that these products are, you know, all of our products are uh, medical devices. They are C marked here in the in 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 the Europe, and we go via the FDA to get uh, the approvals that we need in the US, for instance. Um, we currently have two products, so we focus on nicotine addiction, which is uh, a um, uh, yeah, a huge indication, a huge problem. Uh, over a billion people still in the world uh, is smoking. Um, and so that is part of the one of our flagship products in the addiction space. And then we also have mental health. And there we focus a lot on anxiety at the moment. Um, and in particular, we have a product now for, uh, for anxiety for pulmonary fibrosis patients. So that's, um, yeah, that's really a super, super interesting field to go into. Um, both addiction and mental health is really, really interesting. Um, and what we do is generally we partner up with pharma companies um, and we focus on the product development side of things. Um, and we link up with pharma companies to help us, you know, run really solid clinical trials and also then to commercialize these products on the markets. Because in the end, as you have heard, if you've heard some of the other talks to them uh, today, we focus on products that are going to be prescribed by doctors and reimbursed by the healthcare systems in, in the countries that we operate. Um, and this, I can tell you, is a very, very tough, uh, tough and journey. I have not picked this path because it's easy. Uh, that, is, that is for sure. So, yes, um, that being said, um, I wanted to get back to the topic, which is sort of the secret sauce. And I think Instead of uh, you know trying to tell you that there is one secret sauce, I want to get into a couple of um, of points that I want to make, a couple of insights, some of the things that I've learned uh, during my time uh, building this company, and um, I will start with with the first category, which is actually to challenge authority, or even you know making authority work for you instead. Uh, of the other way around. And I will tell you a story of how we got started and, and uh, so, so you can get a little bit more about what, about what I mean. So me and my co-founder or the King founders, none of us had any solid sort of life science experience going into this uh, in this, this venture. Um, but the first thing that we saw, me and my co-founder, when we started this company was the fact that we looked into the healthcare space and we saw you know, hospitals, we saw research organizations, pharma companies, and we looked into the process and what it was like for them to create and how they launch uh, digital products and digital health products and digital therapeutics. And what we saw was a, a very big, I must say, systematic error. Um, we saw these senior, senior doctors, uh, specialist doctors, you know, head doctors of big hospitals, um, surgeons, you, you, uh, you name it, um, together with uh, professors, uh, usually, you know, experts also in their field, in the disease that they're tack you know, tackling, uh, sometimes also together with a farm, one or more pharma directors into the mix. And 
they of course, you know, with all their experience thought that they knew exactly what um, the problem was that they were solving. They knew exactly what the patient wanted. We have, you know, we have treated hundreds and hundreds of patients. We know what they want and what they need. Um, and we then design, we decide what the product should do, what the feature should be, what it should look like, um, or that we just don't really care that much what it looks like because the features are so relevant, right? Um, also, one other problem is that this, Fortunately, this group is usually, of course, not always, but usually we're talking about white uh, male, you know, 55, 60 plus year old, um, you know, year olds who are actually doing this, who are very, uh, you know, homogeneous group as well. And what happened was that they, they did that and no one can question them. No one can question their methods. They go in, they actually, you know, create the product. They, they decide what the product should be. Uh, they invested, you know, millions of euros into building this product and then they launch and, you know, the product comes out and they say, you know, you're welcome world. Here you go. And the patients, you know, start to use them or try to use them and are essentially saying, you know, what, what is this? Like, this is not what we asked for. This is not what we wanted. Why didn't you just ask us? Uh, and even with that sort of feedback, even if that feedback loop, if that feedback is there, the doctors or the other personnel working in these project groups could not question the doctor's authority. Um, so even though they saw that the products didn't perform well, the patients, you know, stopped using them, they didn't like them, they got bad reviews, they could not solve the problem because of authority um, and these internal processes at these big companies. And that's really where me and my co-founders sort of stepped in and said like, you know, this is really an opportunity for us because we don't have the same authority. We have, we're a startup, we're a young company. Uh, we, uh, I, as a CEO of my company have no say whatsoever in what the product should be. And frankly, neither does the product team. And this is, this is where it gets interesting because, you know, the patients, the ones who are actually using the, the, the products, they are the ones deciding. They are the ones telling us what their problems are and how they want them solved. We are merely sort of, yeah, showing them what different alternatives there is and the different paths that we can go down. So this is maybe a little bit exaggerated, but I think it still, it, it, it you know, makes a good point that we should, we have to shift from, you know, senior authority professors making the products into actually putting the power into the patient's hand. And honestly, I think this goes not only into digital therapeutics and, and the actual products that we launch, but in most things in healthcare. We have a, an issue where, you know, authority is taking too much space and is, is deciding too much over processes and solutions um, to problems that honestly, they're not the ones who have them, right? It's actually the patients. So that's the first insight to really use authority in your, uh, to your favor. Um, and the second insight, you know, to drive innovation is really to actively try to break down barriers of getting help in this space. So we saw also very early on in our journey that there's several big barriers for patients from a patient point of view. If I want and need help with something, there are some barriers, right? And we have some obvious ones, which for instance is cost, right? It's too pricey. Uh, I come from, you know, Stockholm, Sweden here. Healthcare is free. That is true for, for several other countries in Europe, for instance, but in most parts of the world, you know, healthcare is really, really costly and expensive, right? And it's a matter of, do I invest in this or not? So we have to overall be able to offer both the patients, a, 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 you know, a cheaper solution, but also the, also the healthcare systems, a cheaper solution. Um, and that is really, really one of the key barriers that we, that we faced. The other more obvious one, I think is just accessibility, uh, accessibility that you have, you know, um, you, you have these patients who want help, um, they need help, but you know, they're working people just like you and me, they, they are working from nine to five. They, they can't just take off, take time off 
in, in the middle of the working hours to travel physically to a site that can be pretty far from where they work, have a, you know, a session with a psychologist, for instance, um, and then, you know, travel back to work and, and, and get half a day off. That's just, that's, that's a luxury that some of us have, but most people don't have, right? And I think this is really one of the revolutions that happened with telemedicine, uh, where you have the, 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 the sessions that can be held, you know, on, um, you know, via your phone and just t talk, uh, talk to a, a therapist or a doctor. But we really want to, you know, accelerate that innovation one step further and make sure that the products that we, uh, that we offer are not dependent on any person behind the product, right? So in all our, our solutions, in all our DTX uh, apps, there are no psychologists on the other side, you know, chatting or coaching or, or, or sort of uh, acting as a part of the treatment. You should, as a patient, be able to use the treatment whenever you want. If that is 3 a.m. in the morning when you're waking up sweating for, because you're craving a cigarette or whenever that is, um, that's where we want to, to be. And finally, uh, to the two, two other um, you know, barriers that are perhaps not so um, clearly outlined. And the first one is <clears throat> knowing that you can get help. I think, I think one of the, uh, one of the great examples here is sleep, actually. There's so many uh, people out there suffering from some version of insomnia or have sleeping uh, difficulties, issues, and it's affected them, affecting them tremendously. I mean, it's so important for us to, um, to have a good night's sleep and, and definitely it's important for us not to, um, you know, suffer from insomnia for a long period of time. That's super, super critical. But most of the time, people don't realize that they can actually get proper help for this. They are, you know, essentially saying, you know, yeah, I had a bad night's sleep or I'm just, I'm not, I, I don't sleep very well. I'm, you know, just one of those people who, who, who can't sleep. So educating these people that, you know, you actually have a problem here and that problem can be solved. You can get help for this. That is incredibly important. So it's actually about educating the patient just as much about that they have an issue um, as much as that they can get help, right? And finally, my sort of favorite barrier that I think especially DTX can manage is the barrier of stigma, right? You know you have a problem. You know that you want, you want help. You know that you need help for your issue. Um, um, we can take addiction as an example. You know, you're drinking too much, um, alcohol addiction, for instance. Um, and even though you know that, most people, unfortunately, stop there. They don't actually take the step, any step, to get, get proper professional help. And this, I think, is definitely one of the promises for digital therapeutics, where you can actually, without having to expose yourself, without having to, you know, show, show that you're, uh, show vulnerability, you can take the first initial steps of getting professional help via a digital health intervention and a digital therapeutics intervention. So that is, you know, some of just, I mean, I'm sure that you can think of even more barriers uh, today in today's healthcare, but those are the couple of barriers that I, I think is, is super, super important. And one second example of, of the of the last uh, barrier of stigma is actually that there was a really interesting study being made in the US where they had a big issue because veterans coming back from the war, um, usually this was study was on um, on the war um, in the Middle East, that the veterans came from a big macho culture. Many of them were suffering from um, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. A horrible, horrible uh, dis disease that you, a disorder that you that you can uh, struggle a lot with, right? Um, but because of the macho culture of the military, they could not see a psychologist. Or when they saw this uh, psychologist, they were uh, talking to someone. They just uh, said, you know, I know everything is fine. I'm good. Um, nothing wrong here. They could not open up. But so they tested, uh, you know, this. They had two groups. One who talked to the psychologist. And another group who got to uh, talk to a, um, a robot. It was a virtual avatar of a robot. So they knew that this was a robot, but the robot also acted as a human and asked questions. Um, 
And what happened was that they could be more vulnerable, right? They could open up. They, they started crying. Uh, they, they had, for the first time in a long time, they could really, um, yeah, be as vulnerable as they needed to be, be able to treat this. So, we could, so they, they saw in the study that that had a uh, better effect, actually, when there was no, and it was not, you know, despite not being a, a, pro, a, a person there, but it was because there was no person. It was so effective, right? And I also want to make a point here that, I mean, me and Alex as a company, the, the company I'm, I'm from, we're not really after replacing uh, people. Um, and honestly, we don't have to, because there's such a great unmet need for these issues in addiction, in mental health, and for chronic issues, that there are by far a greater um, demand for the product um, than what you have doctors and psychologists being able to treat this, right? So, so this is... Um, uh, this is also key, I think. So moving on to um, partnerships, and this is also one of, one of my insights, sort of uh, what has really helped us excel um, and innovate faster, and that is through uh, through partnerships. So it's impossible as a, especially as a startup, um, um, to know everything and have all the expertise uh, in house, right? Um, as I mentioned initially, we partner up with pharmaceutical companies, and by doing that, we can both really, it's sort of a, it's always a one plus one equals three or more, right? Because we have huge expertise in how we can actually, you know, build these products, we can, how we interact with patients, and we can always, you know, we can always make sure that we move in startup speed. Whereas pharma companies have many processes in place that sort of prevents them uh, to move that fast and to innovate as fast as we could. But they have a huge, um, you know, you have huge amounts of resources when it comes to, you know, knowledge about the indication that you're battling, access to experts and doctors, access to, to patients, right? Um, and experience in, in this field. So that is, in, that is invaluable, right? So we... Um, we always believe that to really be able to excel in, in innovation and honestly in anything, you have to um, partner up with the right institutions. And we, we are working mainly with pharma companies. It doesn't have to be pharma companies. It can also be, you know, research organizations. It can be, you know, the government in some aspects, um, you know, insurance companies, uh, patient advocacy groups. Um, I think that is really one of my, my, my best tips if we want to accelerate, that we need to start to work together better and, and, and you know, bind really long-term partnerships. And finally, um, I think the other, uh, one other key insight here is, is to stay as close to the problem you're solving as you, as you possibly can. It's so, so easy to make the mistake that you assume that you know the problem you're solving. So never assume that you know the problem that you're solving. And in the context of, of this talk for us, it's about you know, asking questions, interviewing, talking to patients. If you want to build a product, if you want to solve um, a problem of you know, nicotine addiction or alcoholism or depression or anxiety, you have to go out and talk to the people who are having these issues and ask them over and over again, sometimes the same questions three times in a row of what is, what is the problem for you? How are you experiencing it? What, what is that? Can you talk to us and rank the issues that you're having? In many cases, you, you assume that you know yeah, of course, it's, you have problems because of that. But when you talk to the patients, and we've learned this over and over again by having hundreds and hundreds of patients interviews during our product development processes, to actually, you have to drag that answer out of, of the patient and really ask, this, ask them uh, this question many, many, many times and many other questions. And when you've been out there, you talk to the patients, and we, we that, like we do, we go back, we try to, Put something together we design something and as soon as we've done that we have to be careful not to assume that we now solve the solve the problem right but go back to the patients and new patients and show them what we've done 
uh, you know, ask them, is this, re is this a good way of solving your problem or is something else that has come up? And then you'll hear other things, or then you will understand that you actually misinterpreted what, what they uh, told you the first time. Uh, and now it's something else that is more important. And one, I guess, one example of this is a patient, um, you know, that we met. And when we work in the field of cancer, um, we also build a building product for um, mental health product solution for cancer patients. You know, you often, you would assume that you, what you're going into and how you're helping these, these patients is that you're going to try to get them to survive for as long as possible, right? If you can just get one more week or two more weeks or one more month, whatever it is. And that is the problem that you're solving. That's sort of the assumption uh, going in. But when you talk, start to talking to these, uh, these people and these patients, what we found out is that actually it's about living your, the rest of the, the, the life that you have left, the time that you have left, with as much dignity as you possibly can, right? And as full, with as, have as a fulfilling life as you possibly can while, um, yeah, um, while going through this. So working with aspects such as, um, you know, understanding, you know, the, what, what values you have, what is important for you, how can you, you know, uh, how can you fulfill your life in, in, in various ways? Like working with those kinds of topics are actually more important than for, for not for definitely not for all people, but for some people uh, struggling with cancer, for instance, than adding an extra uh, week or two or, or a month to your, your life. Um, so this is a couple of insights. Um, there's four minutes left, so I wanted to sort of open up for, um, yeah, for, for the audience, for you guys, if you have any questions um, to me. Um, otherwise, I think I'll, I'll wrap up and uh, yeah, give a few minutes to, to you. Uh, Again. Thank you for the perfect time and perfect timing and for mm -hmm. the perfect presentation and content. Uh, amazing. I am I'm, I'm amazed by how promising digital therapeutics are by the example you provided. And um, yes, probably this is the future. And I like the message that they are there to complement uh, people, experts, doctors, and not to replace them, but to address unmet needs. Um, and, and, and help overall patients or the society. Uh, we have one question probably related to the point of partnership uh, you mentioned in your talk. Do you work with patients or patient groups or, or uh, users during the design and development process of the digital therapeutics and what this brings to the process? Yes, excellent question. And the answer is yes, absolutely. That is, I think, what we as a company do a bit differently from other companies in this field. Um, we, uh, during the development process of building a new product, we do um, what we call deep, is deep dive interviews uh, with patients. So we essentially come to them um, without anything. And we just start talking to them about and asking them questions about Okay, so we're building now we're building an anxiety product for uh, cancer patients, for instance, just to describe understanding what is their world like, what is their life like, what are they suffering from, how can we actually help them, right? And uh, we take that insight, we go back, we we build something, we draft something, um, we take that the design frameworks, we show them something, um, and then give their take their feedback. Is it is this really helping them? Is it not helping them? And throughout this process, if we go back and forth, um, we have had in the last project uh, that we've done, we've done over, you know, 400 deep interviews, two hour interviews with, you know, different patients, right? Um, and often it, that is in collaboration with patient advocacy, advocacy group, to your point, right? So, and the amazing thing about this is that when we start talking to them and we just show them what is potentially possible, most of them say, when can we have this, right? This is incredible. When can we have the solution? They get so eager. And unfortunately, it takes us more than a couple of weeks to get the full product in place. Um, but they really become ambassadors and, and are incredibly excited about being part of that journey. So it, the patients are the most important partner that we have in product development.
Nice to hear this. I'm a patient advocate myself, so it's it's. I'm really happy to to see this patient centric approach in developing digital therapeutics because it's it's really important to have the user involved in the process. Mm. Yes, congratulations for for all you do. Thank you. And good luck with with all your projects uh, in the future. Yeah, thank you so much, and thank you for having me and for everyone listening. Have a great. It was a real pleasure. You too.